you read Scar Tissue? The, uh, the, the Red Hot Chili Peppers? Peppers? I'd not. Anthony Kiedis wrote a book called Scar Tissue. It's a great rock and roll book. So in Scar Tissue, which was from 2004, it was Anthony Kiedis' biography. Great book. He had said that in Super Bowl XI, his father, Blackie Damet, Blackie Dammit, had sold weed to two Raiders players who smoked it and they were high for the whole. And he never named names, but he said that he was uh, that his dad had sold weed right before the game to two of the Raiders who had smoked it with his dad and they were as high as giraffe nuts during the game. So that was Super Bowl eleven, just two things. But back to uh, three things. Back to Madden. He became the youngest coach to reach 100 career regular season victories, a record he compiled in only 10 full seasons, and coaching at the age of 42. That's tough. Coming up with ten regular a hundred regular season victories in ten full seasons by the age of forty two probably won't happen again. Yeah. He's still the coach with the most wins in Raiders history. He never had a losing season as a head coach. Never had a losing season as a head coach. And his overall winning percentage, including playoff games, is the highest among any coach who coached at least a hundred games or more. Okay? That's that's John Madden. That's what everyone either knows or should know about him. That's what Clem gushed about afterwards, right? Because he was a huge Madden fan. But it was Jerry Thornton, our old friend Old Balls, Jerry Thornton no from well. up north who, uh, who reminded me of something else. Uh, Jerry had posted a picture of himself at a Patriots game last weekend, if you look on Jerry's timeline. I'm going to just say it. Jerry's a weird-looking dude. So don't go. No, I'm just kidding. I love Jerry. So he posted a picture of himself wearing a Patriots jersey that had the number 84 on it. Dion Branch? No, somebody. Is it, or is it? Uh, no, it wouldn't be Ben Watson, would it? No. Daryl Stingley. Oh. So I think it was 84. But so somebody had asked him, why are you wearing that jersey? And Jerry said, look it up. And so I looked it up. And then once I heard the name. I think it was 84 now. I got to check it. Once I heard the name, Daryl Stingley, I immediately knew the story because I almost used Daryl Stingley's story in the Twisted History of Athletes Stories, the Positive Edition, that I hosted with Jerry a year ago today. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wild? So I said, shit, I'm going to use it now, and you're going to see why I'm using it while we're talking about um, John Madden. So the gentleman's name was Daryl Stingley. Right, that's the jersey that Jerry was wearing. If someone can check what Daryl Stingley's number is, I think it was eighty-four. So he was in a five-year NFL wide receiver with the Pats, and he was paralyzed. Eighty-four after being hit by Raiders' infamous assassin, safety Jack Tatum. Jack Tatum was a bad man, mm -hmm. bad man, helmet to helmet contact, all that shit, and he was unapologetic. So in a preseason game in nineteen seventy-eight, uh, Jack Tatum laid out this Patriots wide receiver with a shot, his, his shoulder pad to Stingley's head. This is in a preseason game, preseason game, right? Tatum's coach was none other than John Madden. And I'm going to read what Jerry wrote about the incident. So this is Jerry Thornton, what he wrote about the incident. Because I, I like the way Jerry writes. I just like Jerry. So here's my, my Jerry impersonation. I'm going to confess something here. As a kid, I hated John Madden. Hated because I hated the Raiders, and they reflected his personality. They were loud, obnoxious, relentless, tough as hell, and supremely talented, just like Madden. Obnoxious, relentless, tough as hell, and supremely talented, just like Madden. I'd see him on the sidelines, waving his big, meaty hands, and screaming at the refs, and he came across as the embodiment of everything I hated about his players. That's what Jerry wrote. And then it all changed. In a preseason game, Raiders safety Jack Tatum hammered Patriots wideout Daryl Stingley with the most vicious, sadistic, and unnecessary cheap shot in NFL history. Again, that's a quote from Jerry. Yeah. If you look at it, I think there are worse cheap shots, mm -hmm. to be quite honest with you. And I know that Jerry is, is an excellent writer, and he's doing this partially for effect. But if you do look at it, it's one of those ones... I think the fact that Tatum was so unapologetic after what had happened had made it even worse. So I'm going to interject. Unlike today's NFL, there wasn't a flag thrown. There wasn't a fine levy. The hit was not against NFL rules at the time, 
as it was not helmet to helmet, it was shoulder to helmet. Stingley's helmet made contact with Tatum's shoulder pad, compressing his spinal cord and breaking his fourth or f- and fifth cervical vertebrae. Just bad angle, bad angle. Mm-hmm. But I'll go back to Jerry's recount of the incident. So this is back to Jerry Thornton. I was watching it on TV with my brothers, and in an instant, we all knew that was no ordinary hit. And we were right. Stingley never walked again. Instead, he dedicated his life to raising money to helping people with spinal cord injuries. While Tatum wrote a series of books bragging about his kill shot, the first of which was titled, They Call Me Assassin. Eventually, Jack Tatum lost a leg (laughs) and ended up in a wheelchair until he was fitted with a prosthetic. The doctor said it was due to diabetes, but I'd like to think the real cause was karma. Those are Jerry Thornton's words, and I think it's well, well written. I'm going to interject again. The injury came just after Stingley had finished negotiating a contract extension that would have made him one of the highest paid receivers in the NFL. But this is preseason, right? So he's contract negotiating. They have the contract already. He goes to play a preseason game on the West Coast. The new contract was to be announced when the Patriots returned from the West Coast. Instead, it was never signed. He never got a fucking penny. However... A settlement was reached with the NFL under which the Patriots agreed to pay for all of Stingley's medical expenses for the rest of his life, as well as his, because he went back to Purdue and finished his, uh, his degree, and his children's educations. That's, that's, that's nice to hear. Yeah. And his kids wound up doing pretty well. Stingley's son, Derek, who was only seven when he saw his dad get paralyzed, was selected to the 1993 Major League Baseball draft as a center fielder by the Philadelphia Phillies, where he spent three years in their minor league system. He then played eight seasons of arena football. And then that guy, Derek Stingley, who is Daryl Stingley's son, Mm -hmm. had a son, which is Daryl's grandson, Derek Stingley Jr. He was rated the number one player for the class of 2019 by Rivals.com and currently plays cornerback as a junior for LSU. He won a national championship in 2019 as a consensus All-American and was a two-time first-team All-SEC in 2019 and 2020. So his legacy lives on. But the reason I bring the Stingley story up while talking about Madden is, as I mentioned before, John Madden was the opposing coach the night Stingley was paralyzed. And right after the game, this is cool, right after the game, Madden rushed to the hospital to check on Daryl. In fact, since the Pats were on the road, Madden, and so Stingley's family wasn't there or anything? Right, the whole team goes back to New England. The whole team He's gets on the fucking the plane. Yeah. Madden's the only person that goes to visit him in the hospital. Mm-hmm. I think that's extraordinary. And you he can't text fat fuck, and he goes, "Yeah, you can't text." He's You're right. going to text him. He's not like there with the. Oh, don't worry, I can FaceTime and text all these people. Nope, it's just him and John Madden. None of the Patriots were there. None, None of the, so this was 1978, so it was before Bill Belichick, probably before like Kra- I, I don't way before Kraft. Kraft yeah, bought him in '96. Yeah, yeah, so way before Kraft, way before. So he can't be mad at anybody now. None of the Patriots were there. Madden gets there, starts spending time with the kid. He goes, gets a phone. He calls the airport and gets in touch with the Patriots plane, which is on the tarmac. It turns around, and the Patriots come to the air, to the fucking okay. hospital. Maybe they didn't know the severity of it, but I just think that it shows that Madden was a good guy, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So as the team's charter plane in takeoff mode finally returned to the gate. The visit was the beginning of a close friendship between Madden and Stingley that lasted until Stingley's death in 2007. And that's where I'm going to close with Jerry Thornton's words again. At the end of that season, Madden retired from coaching because what happened to Stingley bothered him so much. I know Madden had some health issues also, but what happened to Stingley really stuck in his fucking craw because he was the coach on the other side. Despite the fact that Madden was just 42 years old, and in his five final seasons, his Raiders had gone 56 and 16. That's not bad. He still quit the job he loved over concern for a complete stranger. He had turned into a great friend in the younger man's hour of need. That's who John Madden was. Those are Jerry's words. I think they're very well written. And listen, Madden, like I said, had some health issues when he stepped away from coaching. But for people who may only know him as a coach or a legendary announcer or a legendary name on a video game, I think that 
reflection by Jerry Thornton and partially by us is how I think that John Madden should be remembered. In the summer of 1939, the British government began preparing for the outbreak of World War II, right? So they're ready to be just strafed by German uh, bombers, right? Part of that preparation involved the formation of the National Air Raid Precaution Animals Committee, NARPAC. It's actually pretty cool sounding. A committee tasked with deciding how to handle pets once war commenced, right? I mean, war was coming to our shores. This is Britain talking. What are we going to do with all the pets when the shit hits the fan? The committee worried that due to inevitable wartime food shortages, owners would either have to split their rations with their pets or leave their animals to survive, excuse me, to starve. We saw that in the uh, siege of Leningrad. Leningrad was overrun with uh, rats at one point when the uh, Nazis had invaded or were on the outside kind of uh, holding all the Russians in. And there were no cats to chase these rats because most of the people who owned cats who lived in Leningrad had already uh, cooked them. A lot of people in Russia had cooked and ate their pets. They're eating, uh, they're eating their belts and their shoes and Vaseline. They're taking tubs of Vaseline and just eating it, anything to fill their stomach. So this NARPAC place wanted to kind of avoid having problems with people having too many pets. So they published a pamphlet titled Advice to Animal Owners. The pamphlet said, if at all possible, send or take your household animals into the country in advance of an emergency. And it concluded that if you cannot place them in the care of neighbors, it really is kindest to have them destroyed. It also featured an advertisement for a pistol that could be used to humanely kill animals. It's pretty fucking, that's heady. The recommendation printed in almost every newspaper and announced on the radio spread throughout the country. After war was declared on September 3rd, 1939, Pet owners flocked to clinics and animal homes to have their pets killed in preparation for food shortages. Due to the mass hysteria, and I'm going to say this slow, due to the mass hysteria that was caused before the outbreak of the war, historians estimate that as many as 750,000 British pets were killed in just one week. Three quarters of a million dogs, like the cute ones right behind you, Vibs, were put to death before the Germans came. When London was bombed in September 1940, I mean, it came to fruition. Shit hit the fan, right? Even more pet owners rushed to kill their pets. And when the war ended, many regretted the British pet massacre. They felt remorse, but often blamed the government for starting the frenzy. So perhaps those animals could have made it through the war. Perhaps they couldn't. But at least three quarters of a million uh, dogs, cats, and household pets were killed in one week before the Germans started to bomb the English. What do you think would happen today if the government sent out an address that was like, hey, you got to kill your pets? <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> People would freak out. People would. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say that because we're a history podcast. I can't imagine modern day society dealing with a lot of the stuff that we talk about. Like I couldn't, I couldn't imagine modern day society dealing with the fact that Macy's has six people, six Doberman Pinchers roaming around. Like, I don't, I don't think that we, we, we've gotten ourselves into a situation where I don't think we have the bandwidth to deal with any of this shit, much less to have the government, um, you know, uh, advertise a gun that's perfect for putting your dog down before the Germans started bombing. And, and believe me, it was a once in a lifetime type thing. The, the German yeah. chancellery, I don't think, you know, had a hard on for dogs or whatever, but they just didn't want to see their people starving, right? Especially splitting rations with man's best friend. So I don't, you know, it wasn't the right um, uh, option for them to be given, but to your point, it could never happen today. It reminds me of that scene in um, uh, Bridesmaids. So these girls were in these like, Big, beautiful dresses at these parties in this gigantic place, Versailles, that all of a sudden, if the if nature called, they would basically go down an abandoned hallway, beautiful abandoned hallway, still marble and Michelangelo pissing vodka in, or whatever the hell yeah. it was, and they would just take shits in the corner. Like, they would just take their underwear off, take shits in the corner, and just I leave them there. I don't think they necessarily wore any. 
Yeah, so perhaps did they, they didn't have any uh, bloomers. Did they have like an assistant in the bathroom? I don't like, know. Hey. Like, I think it would just be one of those yeah. things where you go, you let it go. So it's documented that the night after parties in Versailles, the people who were the servants there would have to go around to various hallways, just clean up uh, piles of human excrement. Disgusting. Oh, I think you that's know wonderful. That, I would you, love you know, to know, you say like, disgusting. Common practice, though. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, what Which else are you going to do? Yeah. You know, like, I mean, but you know those big, poofy ball gowns were getting... Do do on them. Yeah, you had. I to. mean, you can't. I well, no, I don't know. I it's hard to control it. I don't know. I don't. I. You know what? I don't know either. But I find it fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I find it fascinating that the top of French society was taking shits in marble fucking hallways while Louis was next door, like kind of giggling, like the Amadeus. So Louis, if you ever see any of the uh, paintings that he commissioned about himself, and there are plenty. So not paintings that weren't him, but mm-hmm. paintings of Louis the Fourteenth. One of the things that he loved about himself was uh, his legs. So he'd always have his legs in like white stockings with the buckled shoes, with the big heels. And he always has his legs sticking out. If you Google paintings of Louis XIV, he has his legs sticking out, beautiful legs. Yeah. But otherwise, he was one of those guys that would like, right? Look yeah. at the I mean, he's, on him, he's right? a tall drink of water. Yeah, absolutely. And he was one of those guys that would sit at tables and the kitchen to his dining room was a quarter mile away. So, like, his food was, like, brought out in a procession, a quarter-mile procession. I like the feeling of that. I like the feeling of what France was like for rich people around that time. He also owned the Hope Diamond. He was, sorry. No, go ahead. He was 6'4". He was a tall drink of water. That's what they say. He was 6'4", but they weren't sure if it was because of his heels. Yeah, That's that, what they say. That, his heels and his wig. That's like an NBA roster. <laughs> yes, exactly. Height. It's like eh, yeah. he's more like six feet tall. Right, right. Because I'm six five and I know I'm majestic. Yeah. But I mean, I I'm all oh, that's barefoot, baby. Barefoot and no wigs. You mm-hmm. know me. I'm I'm as clean as the day I was born. So uh mm-hmm. so I don't know. I, I put an asterisk next to the six four thing. Um so I'm with he that. owned the Hope Diamond. Mm-hmm. What's the Hope Diamond? If you ever saw Titanic, that's what they thought the Hope Diamond was. It's, uh, the Hope Diamond was never on the Titanic. That's all bullshit. But the Hope Diamond has been around for a very long time. It was called French Blue back when Louis Couture's had it. And when he had it, it weighed over 67 carats. That's a lot. If anyone has ever bought an engagement ring or a wedding ring, you know what 67 carats is. No, you don't. Right? Get a carat and a half for your wife, and all of a sudden it's two months. Like that, that whole thing. 67 carats is a whopper when Louis had it. But it's been cut down by its various owners to what it's now, 45 and a half carats. And it's in the Smithsonian in Washington. It was never on the Titanic. It was the Hope Diamond. They say it was cursed, right? Because I believe it was lost during the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette might have had it when they cut her head off. I, I don't know. But the Hope Diamond used to belong to Louis XIV. He died at 77. Right, he died at 77 on August 13th, 1715, a few weeks after complaining about a pain in one of his beautiful legs. He became seriously overweight in his old age, and his left leg turned gangrenous. Oh. So that's how he had died. Gangrene's not a good way to die, and that's how he had died. His corpse was divided into three parts: his body, his heart, and his entrails which was a tradition for French kings that started several centuries earlier. They didn't just bury you. They buried you, they entombed your body, and then they split up your heart and your entrails, and they kept them elsewhere, normally in certain churches and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So they did the same thing for him. His body was buried, his heart and his entrails were somewhere else. Louis' heart was embalmed and placed in Iglesia des Jesuites on Rue Saint-Antoine in Paris. Nailing all these things. So that's where his heart was. However, during the French Revolution, the Sun King's heart was stolen. And it ended up in the possession of someone named Lord Harcourt, the Archbishop of York, which is kind of cool. And Lord Harcourt, the Archbishop of York, had a dinner party where he invited a gentleman named William Buckland, this Englishman named William Buckland, over. So he visited Harcourt in 1848 and he learned that uh, the archbishop had the mummified heart of the Sun King. He said, can I see it? He saw it. He took it and he ate it. He just gulped it down. And I'll explain that. Buckland was a freak. He was a geologist. He was a paleontologist. He was a zoologist. But he was known as a man who wanted to eat everything. Buckland's favorite snack was something called mice on toast. It's kind of self-explanatory. He also ate porpoise. He ate panther. He ate dog. He ate sea slugs, he ate kangaroo, and he ate moles. His ultimate goal was to taste every animal on earth. And I get it. 
right? I, I get it. And you it's not apples to, to apples, but like I drank the cognac of Louis Trez, mm -hmm. like, you know, because I wanted a connection. No biggie. Yeah. Very expensive, but, you know, like, so the whole thing. So Buckland tasted the limestone wall of an Italian cathedral just to disprove the legend that it was imbued with the, um, with the blood of saints. They said that this limestone wall used to get damp from the blood of saints. So this guy said, no, no, I'll go. Buckland yeah. went over there, started licking the wall, and his culinary expertise concluded that it wasn't saint's blood, but it was bat urine instead. Ah, yeah, yeah. bat piss. That's, that's yeah. how COVID started. <laughs> so then when this weirdo was at a dinner party, the mummified heart of a legendary French king was put in front of it. He popped it like a McNugget. The mummified heart had shrank to about the size of a walnut by the time Buckland got to see it. It was 1848, so that was over 130 years this thing was just shriveling. Makes sense. So, yeah, so, I mean, to have it down probably wasn't his whole heart. So to have it go down to a mummified uh, walnut, like the toe that we spoke about. Right. The, up in the Yukon. The drink. Yeah, you got to do it Sip toes. You got to tuck the toe. Yeah. So this guy popped it, and that was it. Um, so Louis XIV, one of the most... I'll say it, iconic kings ever of France, died 130 years later. His heart was eaten by an eccentric British dude. Like, I, I, I don't know. After Louis's death, just to keep that theme going, I think he had already, like, his, he had already survived his kids. So the throne went to his great-grandson, who was then crowned Louis XV, and his great grandson was only five when he took over the throne. So Louis came in when he was four. His great grandson took over for him when he was five. And Louis the Fifteenth had went on to govern France for the next fifty nine years. So that's 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 a nice run mm -hmm. from the thirteenth through the fifteenth. And then after the fifteenth, we're going to get into the French Revolution, which I'm done. I'm done with Louis the Fourteenth right now. You get into the French, and things start to get hairy. But the Louis. It had a nice little run in there. Was it like 120 years for the two yeah, of them? Yeah, what the hell not, right? Well, I wonder if it's better to be a king when you're four years old or if it's better to come into being a king when you're 30. Yeah, because you don't know what you have, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, because if you're, if you're four... You never you, had a callus. All you, all you know is being a king. I have a small history describing Japanese wartime practices that trump those by the Nazis. Those inhuman experiments that happened in Japanese Unit 731, for example, jumps to mind. That was just absolutely atrocious. And listen, this is tallest midget in the circus type shit. Excuse me, Zah. But it's, you know, they're both, you know, they were the bad guys in World War II. They were the bad guys. And the Japanese were worse when it came to this. The sex trade in Japan during World War II was arguably worse than in Germany. Instead of joy division, the Japanese had something called comfort women. Women and girls forced into sexual slavery by the Imperial Japanese Army in occupied countries and territories before and during World War II. Unlike the joy division, records of the comfort women's subjugation are few and far between. There are very few survivors and an estimated 90% of comfort women did not survive the war. So that's the first thing. They killed these girls. Through mil though military brought the military though military brothels existed in the Japanese military since 1932, they expanded widely after one of the most infamous incidents in Imperial Japan's attempt to take over the Republic of China and a broad swath of Asia. And that was something called the Rape of Nanking. Have you ever heard that, the Rape of Nanking? I have not. I know Nanking, but I have never heard of the Rape of Nanking. We discussed King. it at one. I've kept it in my back pocket. I've never gone into this, John. Okay, I thought we Because it. we always have danced around what happened in the Pacific Theater. I think we're going to do it with Vibs because we did, no, with uh, Chief, because we did the Eastern Front, the Western mm -hmm. Front. And I said, well, save the Pacific Theater. It was part of World War II Museum that I didn't go into. I know very little about the Pacific Theater. I know about Nanking. By the way, Nanking was before World War II. The Rape of Nanking was before World War II. I, I, I just watched the movie The Thin Red Line, so leaving me out of the Pacific Theater, probably not the best idea, but... <laughs> you know what? What about Pacific? I want to watch that. Did you ever watch that? The Band of Brothers Part no, 2? No, I, I, I still haven't seen the uh, right. Band of Brothers for the... 
by you're the way, up. you're always more than welcome to be in with Chief. I love Chief. Uh, like, you, I, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. joking. No, I'm joking. No, yeah, you know. But yeah, oh, Chief, yeah. Chief is just the Chicago, he's like the Chicago history 100%. guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. He always has good blogs on, yeah. on history. Yeah, he's just good guys. Yeah. yeah. On December 13th, 1937, Japanese troops began a six-week-long massacre that essentially destroyed the Chinese city of Nanking. And along the way, Japanese troops raped between 20,000 to 80,000 Chinese women. Why did they do that? Since the end of World War I, the Chinese and Japanese were at war over access to raw materials on what is now Korea and mainland China. So they were at war trying to figure out how they can divvy up most of Asia, I should say. After, so these were called the, the Sino-Japanese Wars. There were two of them, two main ones. After the second Sino-Japanese War broke out in 1937, the aggressive and disciplined Japanese troops were winning. Again, they won the first one. They had already managed to take Shanghai and had just taken the city of Nanking, which was the capital of nationalist China. With the retreat of Chinese forces, the Japanese took that city with relative ease. The Chinese decided to retreat. They backed out of Nanking, mm-hmm. leaving most of the residents in almost like what they thought was a safe zone, which was about the size of Central Park. So when the Japanese came in, guns in one hand and dicks in the other, it was fucking huge problems. It was one of the most disturbing times in history. After the city had fallen, Iwani Matsui, the commander of the Japanese forces, allowed his troops to have free will with the people of Nanking as a complete destruction of the city would help give the Japanese a psychological advantage over nationalist China. Like Remember we were talking about, a, not a Peloponnesian war, we were talking about a war where the victor not only wiped out the city, they also salted the earth of where they had just conquered so nothing would fucking grow there. Like, you know what I mean? Like, when you're wiping people out, then there's pettiness. This was downright evil pettiness. Over the next six weeks, six weeks, the exhausted Japanese army absolutely destroyed the people of Nanking. An estimated 300,000 people were killed in six weeks, with nearly all of them being Chinese women, children, and the elderly. Men were forced to rape their families. Children were beaten with rifles for wearing traditional Chinese clothes. Children were buried alive while they watched soldiers rape their mothers. And thousands were slaughtered meaninglessly by firing squads and then dumped into mass graves. Tough paragraph. The International Military Tribunal for the Far East estimated that at least 20,000 and maybe as many as 80,000 including some children and the elderly women, were raped during the occupation. A large number of those rapes were done systematically by the Japanese soldiers as they went from fucking door to door searching for girls, with many women being captured and then gang raped. The women were often killed immediately after being raped, even though there would be some explicit mutilation beforehand, penetrating vaginas with bayonets, long sticks of bamboo or other objects. Young children were not exempt from these atrocities and were actually cut open to allow Japanese soldiers to rape them. I won't repeat that sentence. On December 19, 1937, an American missionary named the Reverend James M. McCallum wrote this in his diary. I know not where to end. Never have I heard or read of such brutality. Rape, rape, rape. We estimate at least a thousand cases a night and many by day. In case of resistance or anything that seems like disapproval, there's a bayonet stab or a bullet. People are hysterical. Women are being carried off every morning, afternoon, and evening. The whole Japanese army seems to be free to go and come as it pleases and do whatever it pleases. This is one of the scariest times in history. You don't want to be a Jew at the beginning of World War II. Right? You don't. Right. You don't want to be a African anywhere near a slave ship that lands before it goes to the New World and fucks your life. Mm-hmm. Right? You don't want to be a woman in Nanking in the mid-30s. It's, it's fucking... During the Japanese reign of terror, a member of the American Episcopal Church mission 
who had been there for almost a quarter of a century, this guy was named the Reverend John McGee, took motion pictures to eloquently bear witness to these uh, atrocities, atrocities committed by the Japanese. On December 13th, about 30 soldiers came to a Chinese house in the southernmost part of Nanking and demanded entrance. The door was opened by the landlord named Ha. They killed him with a revolver and also Mrs. Ha, who knelt before them after Ha's death, begging them not to kill anyone else. Mrs. Ha asked them why they killed her husband. They shot her. Mrs. Ha was dragged out from under a table in the guest hall where she tried to hide with her one-year-old baby. After being stripped and raped by one or more men, she was bayoneted in the chest and then had a bottle thrust into her vagina. The baby was killed with the bayonet. Some soldiers then went to the next room where Mrs. Hesiah's parents, aged 76 and 74, and her two daughters, aged 16 and 14, were. They were about to rape them when the when grandmother tried to protect them. The soldiers killed her with the revolver. The grandfather grasped the body of his wife, then he was killed. The two girls were then stripped, the elder being raped by two to three men, and the younger by three. The older girl was stabbed afterwards, and a cane was rammed into her vagina. The younger girl was bayoneted but was spared the horrible treatment that had been meted out to her sister and mother. The soldiers then bayoneted another sister between seven and eight, who was also in the room. The last murders in the house were of Ha's two children, aged four and two respectively. The older was bayoneted and the younger was split through the head with a sword. Holy shit. Like, that type of shit alone is worse than any fucking Saw movie. You want to talk about disturbing. It's worse than anything that gets written down in fiction. That's right? rough. Yeah, you can't... You, you can't script that shit. And I know that war is hell, and I know that it fucks with people, but the pure evilness of the rape of Nan King, it echoed through the ages. They tried not to have it echo through the ages, but it certainly did. And that's fucking crazy. But you know what's not crazy? Having sex. And you know what's going to help you have sex? Roman. Most guys have tried different ways to last longer in bed, particularly the guy who went to the Pasha. Some people try to think of government-issued crack pipes. Other people think of baseball. But the folks at Roman, an online men's health company, are changing the game with Roman Swipes, the secret to lasting longer in bed. It's discreet packaging that comes to you. You pop it into your wallet, take it out, rip it open, wipe it on yourself, let it dry, and then you can go all goddamn night. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to try these things out, Phipps. I mean, a guy like you, why not have that fun? Absolutely. I mean, you don't run out of energy. So with me, I'm, I sort of have enough to get to where I need to, and then I kind of run out. But Roman is the place to go if you want to last longer, and they got a whole bunch of other shit available. And how do you do it? You go to getroman.com slash twisted, and you'll get your first month of swipes for just $5. That's when you choose a monthly plan. I don't know how many they give you a month might be embarrassing it might not but you go to getroman.com slash twisted and you get your first month of swipes for just five bucks when you choose a monthly plan go there and why don't you give her a shot to finish just one time dibs right just put her on the fucking tape just one time you weren't here for the genocide thing i did that with chief we did the twisted history of genocide i never mentioned that california was had their own little genocide gold spelled prosperity and power for white settlers who arrived in California in 1849, the 49ers. But it meant disaster for the indigenous population. This is ugly. This is California's little known genocide. In just 20 years, 80% of California's Native Americans were wiped out. And though some died because of the seizure of their land or diseases caught from new settlers, between 9,000 and 16,000 were just murdered, just flat out murdered in cold blood the victims of a policy of government genocide sponsored by the state of California and assisted by its citizens. People were told by the government to kill Indians. One of the state's first priorities was to rid itself of its sizable Native American population, and it did so with a fucking vengeance. Hundreds of thousands of Native Americans, speaking up to 80 different languages, populated this area for thousands of years before we got there thousands of years. Then in 1850, became a state, and the federal government thought it was imperative to make room for the new settlers and lay claim to the gold on traditional tribal lands. So the government called them the Indian problem, and they thought it was one of the biggest threats to its sovereignty. So a guy named, a jerk-off, named Peter Hardenman Burnett, he was the first governor of California. 
And he saw the indigenous people as lazy, savage, and dangerous. And at the first, the very first state, uh, the very first session of the state legislature, he gave white settlers the right to take custody of Native American children. Sounds a lot like what had happened with Native Americans up in Canada, right? Yeah. When they were able to take them out and send them to those goddamn schools. And for a little, yeah, because for a little historic. Shitty vodka. Yes. For a little historical perspective, Burnett also at one point tried to ban black people from California. He didn't think that blacks were good for California. So he's going to try to stop any person of color from entering into the state. It didn't work out. The law also gave white people the right to arrest native people for minor offenses. It made it possible for whites to put native Americans convicted of crimes to work on their farms and on their stuff to pay off the fines that they incurred. And then inevitably the law was widely abused and ultimately led to the enslavement of tens of thousands of Native Americans. This is in the United States. That a war, and this is a quote, that a war of extermination is to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. That was said by Governor Burnett. And he told that in his second state of the state address in 1851. Burnett set aside state money to arm local militias. The state, with the help of the U.S. Army, started assembling a massive arsenal. And these weapons were given to those local uh, militias who were tasked with killing Native people. State militias raided tribal outposts, shooting and sometimes scalping Native Americans. Local settlers began to do killings themselves. Local governments put bounties on Native American heads and paid settlers for horses that they stole from the Native Americans that they murdered. Large massacres wiped out entire tribal populations while white settlers in the California government enslaved Native people and forced them into labor for ranchers at least through the mid-1860s. They were then forced onto reservations, whoever was left, and their children were forced into these Indian assimilation schools, which sound an awful lot like the Canadian Indian residential schools, which seem to have burial grounds popping up all over the place. People bring up uh, Canadian residential schools to me probably more often than any other topic. We did cover them in the Twisted History of Canada, which we think was one we took down because we had a bunch of music in it. So we're going to get it up at some point. But we did cover these schools, and it was absolutely despicable what had gone up uh, out there. An estimated 100,000 Native Americans died during the first two years of the gold rush alone. 100,000. And by 1873, only 30,000 indigenous people remained. Okay? So I'm going to sum that up because I gave you a lot. I'm just going to tell you about the genocide that California had right here. Okay? I'm going to tell you about it right now. I'm going to sum it up. In 1770, way back, 1770, there were over 300,000 indigenous people in California. 300,000. By the time it became a state in 1850, that was cut in half to 150 of them. So 1770 to 1850, you went from 300,000 to 150,000. And then by 1870, only 20 years later, that 150 was cut down to 30. That's unfortunate. And even though the U.S. government officially recognized their role by stating an apology for the first time in 2019, they didn't say they were sorry until 2019, that they were part of funding at least the murder of 16,000 of the aforementioned indigenous people. I'm sure it's not widely known, but I am sure that's a genocide. We did a whole episode on genocide and California didn't make the cut somehow, but maybe they should have. California had a secret genocide where they decimated the Indian population from essentially 300,000 down to 30. going to talk about another guy maybe you want to remember his name is james marion sims he's the father of modern gynecology sims developed pioneering tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health more specifically he invented something called the vaginal speculum a tool used for dilation and mm. examination this is a vaginal speculum yep so it looks like a sort of like a hey how are you I'm a a duck. Vaginal it, looks, speculum. it looks like a duck it does yes. yeah yeah a, a metallic duck so but back then when you were trying to give a woman an internal exam the vagina was considered uh gross not gross but it was sort of like taboo they really didn't know how to do it so this guy had taken a bent pewter spoon and he had shucked the clam a little bit like he had opened up and that way he was able to go in he wound up creating this thing where you can kind of insert open up, and then kind of do what you need to do through the opening. So this is a speculum. Yeah. 
it's unbelievable how easy it is to purchase a speculum. Not mm. that you, I mean, not that you're going to smoke crack with it or anything, but they say it's a big fetishist item. Yep. So when I went yep. on Amazon two days ago, I had 16 different options to get it to me within 24 hours. So I got this one. Is that is that the Cadillac of septulums? I I, I was spe- uh, speculums. Speculums. I, yeah, <laughs> I went with the one that was 14. dollars So anyway, this is what he had, uh, this is what he introduced, and it's still used. Uh, Andy, this is still used today, right? They it's like, yes. it's yeah. like a car jack for yeah. a vagina. Yes. Now they keep them in warming trees. Yes, Ooh, thank God. See, I like that. Yeah. It's the little things. Yeah. yeah. You could use this for like a colonoscopy the too, right? Things. Yeah. Oh my God. I get. I don't know. Oh, like, the you whole could. Idea is I mean, you wouldn't get very far with a colonoscopy. <laughs> no, I'm saying if you oh, need to you get you the tube. Oh, you can force it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Either way. So he he invented this. He invented the uh, the uh, the speculum. It's used for dilation and examination. He also pioneered a surgical technique to repair something called vesi. Covaginal fistula. It's a common 19th century complication of childbirth in which a tear between the uterus and the bladder caused constant pain. In 1876, (laughs) he was named president of the AMA, the American Medical Association. And this is why, believe me, it rips women apart. God bless you. (laughs) It rips women apart. It's fucking. Don't, uh, don't they how staple the it? fuck did Miss Higgins have 18? I heard they staple uh, it together. There's some sewing. I wouldn't, and no, I didn't do yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Nope. Right. Uh, I heard yeah. because women have like oh. less, less nerve endings oh. and smaller brains. They can't yes. feel it. So they just staple them shut. I just, every time I think of childbirth, I think of that fucking pyramid that they used to lower the guys on that you uh, would yeah when, yeah when yeah that's like a septulum thing. a little bit yeah sort of yeah so this guy yeah, speculum. Let, speculum i'm sorry yeah <laughs> I, 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 I stopped it yeah, in yeah. my head i've put that it's septulum and <laughs> right. that's what i'm gonna call it forever right. i should have circled it on the script so again so we're with uh james marion sims so he he developed the speculum from a pewter spoon and he also discovered this um technique to repair this tearing, this fistula that happens sometimes during uh, childbirth, and it causes leakage and constant pain in women who suffer from it. Is that where the phrase, she was born with a pewter spoon in her vagina comes from? <laughs> yes, that's yeah. exactly <laughs> why it was. Yes, it was. Uh, in 1876, he was the president of the AMA. In 1880, he became president of the like American that. Gynecological Society. She really did like that yeah. one. Yeah, a silver spoon and a pewter spoon. Uh, he has a half a dozen statues dedicated to him around the country. But the one in Central Park right here was removed in 2018, and it's set to be reinstalled near his grave in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn at some point. Greenwood Cemetery is where my father-in-law has been laid to rest also. But why was that statue taken down from Central Park? Why was Dr. James Marion Sims, who found a way to, uh, to repair fistula, he found a way to look inside a vagina with some degree of class. He sent, Why was it? He sent unwanted texts of his <laughs> penis. <laughs> he did. He to did. his assistant. Right. Why was this guy who did all that shit in and around the 18, I don't know, 18, mid 1800s, called 1860 And that's where the bad part comes in. Sims's research that he did to create all this stuff was done almost exclusively on enslaved black women. And he did it without anesthesia. My God. Similar to Pincus and the birth control story, Sims cared more about the experiments than providing therapeutic treatment. Unlike the Pincus story, Sims practiced medicine 100 years prior in the mid-1800s. So nobody gave a shit that he caused untold suffering by operating under the racist notion that black people didn't feel pain. They didn't deserve fucking... First of all, in his defense, there wasn't a lot of anesthesia around, but there was some. Mm -hmm. He decided to not give it to his test subjects because he thought they did not feel pain. (laughs) I'm going to go quickly into the end here. There's two uh, fairy tales that were possibly based on real life events. We mentioned Hansel and Gretel. I like calling it Hansel instead of Hansel. First is Beauty and the Beast. Gabriel Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve's Belle et la Bête, Beauty and the Beast, published in 1740, was inspired by the real life of Pedro Gonzalez, a man with hypertrichosis born in 1537 in the Canary Islands. So I just said that. He was born with hypertrichosis in the Canary Islands. I feel the need to explain that we've covered the Canary Islands before. They're not named after the bird. The bird's named after the island, and the islands is named after dogs. 
canis. Oh, right? interesting. What, yeah. what type of dog? Oh, like literally canine. Yeah, like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So there was there was uh, inhabited by a group of people that used to worship dogs. So it became the Canary Islands, named after that kind of canine type thing. Gotcha. And then the birds were then named after the island. That's did a little thing that we that. did on the twisted history of dogs. Secondly, hypertrichosis we covered before in the history of freak shows. It's a congenital disorder with excessive body hair, particularly around the neck and the face. Mm-hmm. And one of Vibs's favorite characters since he started doing uh, Twisted History with me is uh, Fedor Jeftichu, a.k.a. Jojo the dog Face Boy, who was exhibited by P.T. Barnum in the United States in the 1800s. Jojo the dog Face Boy. He's, he's, he's uh, I remember him from the movie. Majestic. So Pedro Gonzalez in 1537 on the Canary Islands was also a dog Face Boy. And because people are terrible, he was captured as a child and treated as an animal. I'm telling you all this because I'm telling you this is what the original Beauty and Beast was based upon. It's a real story. Pedro Gonzalez was a hairy guy and he was kept like an animal until he was given raw meat and animal feed until he was gifted to King Henry II of France at the age of 10. So that's what Pedro the dog-faced boy was. Then Henry II of France educated him as a nobleman and changed his name from Pedro Gonzalez to Petrus Consalves. That's a cool ass name. That's a great great name. name. Which is the Latin version of his Spanish name. After Henry II had died, his wife Catherine de Medici married off Gonzalves to the daughter of a court servant who he stayed married to for 40 years and had seven children together. Voila, Beauty and the Beast. They all lived happily ever after. I like that. By the way, that's Catherine de' Medici. That's one of the OG royal families in Italy. Right. They, they, they like ran shit. In 100%. Like the, whole, in the whole trade of, of the Mediterranean and everywhere we else. We could do a Medici. A Medici fa- I call it Medici. Yeah. I apologize. A Medici family um, uh, t- uh, episode. Yeah, for Easily. sure. Easily. Right, absolutely. You could yeah, do one 100. of them. You could do one of the Habsburgs. You could do one of a lot of the Habsburgs. Yeah, are yeah. fascinating. Because we too. did yeah. the Popes. That was that was uh-huh. a royal deep. family yeah. outside of those pieces of shit. Yeah. The, the Medici's you know, like I feel like half the Popes were like put in place by the Medici. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Right. Control. Medici. That's how I pronounce stuff in North Carolina. Yeah. I killed it. That sounds Carolina. like a knockoff Italian restaurant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. From the Medici's, where they write down their name on the thing. for like I'll the be, hot dog Caesar salad or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll be Claire. Would you like some of the chiati? <laughs> so the U.S. finally had a viable polio vaccine, but nobody would take it. And this is where my man comes in. In steps a 21-year-old, smooth-faced, and swivel-hipped hero of the American youth, Elvis fucking Presley, right? A handsome, smooth-faced, swivel-hipped hero of American youth. That's the point I'm trying to make. So this guy was already known as the king, and he wound up doing three appearances on the Ed Sullivan show between September of 1956 and January of 1957. The final one was when he was famously shown only from the waist up. So the first time he goes on Ed Sullivan show, he starts shaking his dick and people go wild. They want it, right? They want it like Annie at a fucking showing of jackass, right? The second time he goes on, people are like, he's going to start swiveling his dick again. I'm going to tune it, tune in. The first episode, he had 60 million people tune in. That's more than a third of the entire population of 168 million in the United States, right? That's not one in three households. That's, that's a third of the people watched Elvis shake his ass, right? No entertainer at the time commanded anything close to that audience. And his fans were swooning, half crazed, damp, first generation rock and rollers, right? And they were in the age group that was saying no to the vaccine. So this is what the king of rock and roll did. Right before his second Ed Sullivan appearance. Right before it. And a month after Love Me Tender was released. So he's he's doing well, right? Yeah. Backstage, he lets cameras in at the Ed Sullivan Theater. He let in everybody with a camera. The journalist out the ass. The New York City Health Commissioner, Leona Baumgartner, held his left arm. And her assistant, Harold Furst, hit the plunger. He got his shot right before he went on Ed Sullivan, and he let it be covered by every major news outlet. So now people are like, Elvis did that when he could be paralyzed or die? This must be fucking okay, right? Shortly after, he released a PSA where he's getting the shot. He stares into the camera and says, 
Hey kids, can I talk to you? This is Elvis Presley. If you believe polio was beaten, I ask you to listen. The fight against polio is as tough as it ever was. Then he gets hit with the fucking shot. People now go crazy about that. After that, town dances went from being called sock hops to being called sock hops because everybody was getting vaccinated with Jonas Salk's vaccines. And there was a huge campaign to get teenage girls to reject dates from unvaccinated teenage boys. So you couldn't get laid from a teenage girl who was an Elvis fan unless you had gotten the shot. That would make me get the shot, right? So I'm not saying it was all due to Elvis, but incidents of the disease, polio, a deadly and paralyzing disease, went down 90% between 1950 and 1960 because of the vaccine, because of the vaccine. But it was a because of a vaccine that nobody wanted to fucking take until Elvis Presley stepped in. Paris, France, where local rat density hovers around 8 million. That figure outnumbers the city's human population 4 to 1. There's just over 2 million people in Paris. There's just over 8 million rats. This is the Four. inspiration Four. for uh, Pixar's Ratatouille. Ratatouille, yes, you're absolutely. Why are they so fucking successful in surviving? Why are rats so goddamn successful? I'm going to give you four reasons. One, they're smart. They have very specialized brain cells known as place neurons. And what these cells do is give rats an uncanny ability to remember locations, allowing them just not, not to just navigate uh, the best routes in and out of your home, but also to consider alternatives as it remembers other possible entry points and exits. Somehow scientists have been able to uh, study rats' brains, and it says the rat comes into a room and it essentially sees it like a movie. It, and I guess that's because it's the most important thing in them. So it's essentially like they're sitting down to see a movie. So when they re-enter that room, they remember it as if they're watching a movie. That's pretty cool, I think. Rats. My life's a movie, bro. <laughs> yeah. They're <laughs> extremely agile. Rats' tails with a length generally as long as their bodies. So two-foot rat is foot tail. Can act as either a counterweight or an extra hand if it needs to wrap around something for a little extra stability. This gives them superior superior agility, and they're able to survive a 50-foot fall. They can fall off a 5-foot building without sustaining any serious injuries. That, that's, that's a good little talent. Else. I mean, you got to whack them with a fucking broom handle then. Yeah. A 50-foot fall? You you got to yeah you got to crush their skull with that broom handle because they're not getting back up. I'm very impressed by rats. They're strong. The average rat can easily move around a one pair a one pound bag of food, and their hind legs are built like springs, allowing them to leap about two feet in the air but four feet across. Rat comes at me, jumps at me from four <laughs> feet away. Holy shit! I will be cross-eyed crazy. That would kill me. And finally, they can fit through really small openings. I think people already know this. So long as a rat's head can fit through an opening, its body can. They can compress their larger bodies and wiggle the way through. That's because their rib cages can flatten and collapse. They're hinged to their spine. Rat ribs are hinged to the spine, allowing them to contract, thereby allowing the rat to squeeze through the hole, then expand back to normal once it's all clear. It's pretty alien, right? Princess Grace Peyton plays Trouble in the Suez. Princess Grace, another absolute stunner. Irish American, by the way. Actress Grace Kelly, that's who Princess Grace was. She appears in her last film that year. The film was called High Society. When you say she appeared in High Society in 1956, people think that she was... You know, buck naked in the fucking magazine. <laughs> it was it was a movie called High Society in 1956. And don't talk about Princess Grace like that. So Grace Kelly appears in 1956. She won two Oscars in her very small career. She retired from acting at only 27 years old. Why would someone with two Oscars retire from acting? I'll tell you why. On a photo shoot, she met uh, Prince Rainier of Monaco, and she wound up marrying him. Before that, she banged Clark Gable, and she was proposed to by Bing Crosby, right? I mean, they, whatever. That must have been a smooth proposal, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so she leaves. So, whatever. So she leaves Hollywood. She gets married uh, to the Prince of Monaco. 
and she quits everything. And it's ultimately it's tragic because she was only 52 when she suffered a small stroke behind the wheel and she drove off a fucking cliff. That's how she died. But here's two small tidbits about Princess Grace. Her father won three gold medals in the Olympics for rowing. That's cool. Yeah, Jack Kelly, her father, Grace Kelly's father, Jack Kelly, is the only rower in the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame. Wow. It's pretty cool. And her mom, Margaret, was the Ivy League's uh, first ever women's sports coach after she organized a basketball squad at UPenn. So she came from, and her dad also made millions uh, as a brick uh, developer, uh, building, um, creating bricks and selling bricks to construction sites. So her dad came from money. So much so that when she married Princess, I'm going off script again. When she married Princess Rainier, he, Prince rather, (laughs) the father of Grace Kelly, the Olympic rower, had to pay a dowry of $2 million. Really? Yeah, had to pay two fucking million dollars for her to marry uh, the prince. Wow. And then one more uh, tidbit. My dad loved her. I know. Yeah. So my dad, I mentioned, you know, my dad's my fucking hero. So my, and my dad and my mom. talks about it all the time. My dad and my mom have a love affair that makes ours look fucking childish. But my dad speaks about Grace Kelly. I don't, I, I don't know. He just loves Grace Kelly. So look up Grace Kelly. She's a beautiful woman and she became Princess Grace and she was in high society in 1956. That's why she's mentioned here. So Princess Grace, Peyton Place, Trouble in the Suez. Peyton mm-hmm. Place was a best-selling, socially scandalous novel by Grace Metallius. It's published in 1956. They sold 60,000 copies within the first 10 days, and it remained on the New York Times bestseller list for 59 weeks. It had a franchise that lasted four decades. It was a movie in 57. They wrote a follow-up novel, Return to Peyton Place, that was made into a film also. It was adapted again in 64. It was a television series. And then the term Peyton Place entered our lexicon describing any small town that holds scandalous secrets. Ooh, that mm-hmm. place is a Peyton That's Place. That's Desperate Housewives. Was, yeah, yeah. Was so Peyton Place was, to- again, like a mm-hmm. cultural happening. Like a Desperate Housewives thing. Right. Or Beverly Hills 90210. Mm-hmm. That type of shit. <clears throat> That's what Peyton Place had become. And then finally, trouble in the Suez. Growing up in Brooklyn... People who sang this fucking song thought it was trouble in the sewers since we don't fucking (laughs) pronounce our R's. So it was always like, yeah, I was having a coffee by the sewer, so there was trouble in the sewers. But it's trouble in the fucking Suez, right? That's just what it is. So the Suez Suez Canal, man-made canal, it's 120 miles long. It connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean Mm -hmm. by way of the Red Sea, allowing goods to be shipped from Europe to Asia more directly. Mm -hmm. It is... Very important. And you had mentioned Abdel Nasser, Gamal right. Abdel Nasser, on October 29th, 1956, yep. the year that we're here, the Israeli armed forces pushed into Egypt toward the Suez Canal after the Egyptian president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, mm-hmm. nationalized the canal. No yes. bueno, people had a big problem with it. So there was trouble in and around, not the sewers of New York. It wasn't like the rats <laughs> were coming up through toilets or the fucking alligators. Trouble in the Suez Canal. And that's... When it goes back to, we didn't start the fire. So there's your chorus right there. We're stopping. So there's 118 references. We just did 55 of them. So we're not even halfway, but that's the way that the song kind of goes into the thing. We're stopping right there. And the other half, which is starting in the 1950s, you know, late 1950s, is going to be next week. Without further ado... <clears throat> Okay, this is going to be painful to everyone listening. I'm yes, so sorry. I'm all ears. I'm ready. Okay, ready? <clears throat> David Portnoy, Milton Days, Gambling Paper, Hottie Babe, Southie Boston, Fenway, Kenmore, Newspapers would go. Paul Gazinski in the mix and Hanks fight Dave on television, deflate gating, handcuffs on, well, off to jail they go. Good L sucks, clown bomb, NFL, Bannon, um, hard dose, the blog website, commenters always fight. Keith K. Marco, big screen, editing the whole scene. Eric Nathan Smitty, blocky rap report, a goodbye. I'll always be a rider. Where the blocks are burning and the bets are earning, I'll always be a rider. No, some folks don't like it, but no use to fight it. I'm really out of shape. That is something else so far. Oh, I'm not going. Keep going. We got more? Oh, buddy, settle in. (laughs) Grab a Snickers. Big Cat Casting, Hot New Pod, PFT Pro Football Talk. Pardon my take, sing P fellas. Yes, sir, dudes rock. HQ moving on. New York City, New Don Stewart Finer calls out. It's a mortal lock. 
Glennie Balls, Burger Dreams, Trenton Riggs, a golfing team, Crazy Page Views, Growing Fans, Caleb Presley, Brand X Fan, Red Sox, Carabas, All Right Frankie, Pizza Bliss, People Pissed, Van Talks Next, Are We Getting Sued? I'll Always Be a Rider, Where the Blocks Are Burning and the Bets Are Earning, I'll Always Be a Rider, Know Some Folks Don't Like It, But No Use to Fight It. So, you know, I got to I gotta keep bobbing my head to stay on beat. Yeah. I yes, absolutely. Yeah, oh, yeah. You thought I was done? This is still going. Still going. This is in. epic. <gasps> Pump Punk Rock, it's the Yak. Dykstra visits, he on crack. Coley Mix, Celtics guy. Deke Zucker is a spy. Rose LeBron, grudge rolls on. Shortport Yankee baseball. Rear Admiral, ho- Rear Admiral Hockey Pride, Bissonette, and Ritney Rye. Windy City, Doinks Hurt, Pod Father Mafia. Uncle Chaps, Astros, Diarrhea, oh no. Brit Troops, Soccer Scream, Lights, Camera, Kennedy. That's Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy yeah. Chubby Units, Make Dough, Bussin' with the Boys, oh. We didn't mama. Travel Show, Donnie's Plan, Stranger in a Strange Land, Dog Walk, Rasselin, Baseball Fans, Tico 10. Kate Talks about her labia, Rip Taint from her baby, yeah. Old Mints. Old Miss Mince Ben making money, Megan. Rob Fox, basement steps with McGregor, he'd have sex. Kelly K, <laughs> Vibs is Bay, Pat and Joey are so gay. Ba 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 ba. <laughs> Almost done, I swear. Wow, this is this is more than I could have ever uh, wished for. This is awesome. KFC Minute Man, Sydney is outdoors again. Moonshot, buy stock, rough, rowdy punch, knock. Reeks blogging all the time. That guy must live online. Million dollars worth of game. BFFs of TikTok came. Plan B, uncut, chicken fry. Something the O'Malley by our side. <laughs> Nailed it. Boy, dad's little sass. Roan out killing battle raps. Rhea, the wheels are falling off. Rhea, okay. friends, say hop for sure. Credit to the Barstool store. Deion Sanders, college stars. I can't take it anymore. That didn't rhyme. Anyway, that's the song. That's, that's I, fantastic. I that is fantastic. The wheels fell oh, apart wow. at the end. Yeah. No, I'm absolutely not. But I yes, thank you so thank much. You. I want it to be known that thank even you. Billy Joe will not sing that song live. Oh, I know. No. Yeah. You came on at the drop of the He refuses to sing it live. Really? He yes. says if he misses one line, he's, he gets off. He's and toast. He just nailed it. I was spending the last 10 minutes trying to get, because if you sing the last parts right, you get it, but the, the structure of it. I guess what I came on to do was show how complex the structure of that song <laughs> yeah. is, well, that it cannot I, be replicated. This is a music yeah. podcast. Though. What was yeah. the hardest rhyme in yours? The whole last couple verses by right. the time you get to the end your brain is fried but you're right it is really you didn't take a breath though i mean you you yeah. blew through you didn't take any time in the fucking my, choruses my favorite line was red. are we getting suez exactly yeah I'm just imagining Kate now shitting out a window of a fucking Humvee. There's been plenty of stories that she said <laughs> that she did. Like, oh, actually, she, yeah. she said that the worst sickness that she's gotten in her entire life was in Afghanistan. Right. And she got diarrhea so bad that she passed out in front of like the trailers that I was talking about. Right. And was just they have essentially what, what we all jokingly refer to as moon dust. Like there's areas in both Iraq and Afghanistan that are so dusty that if you are remotely sweaty, you end up looking like a sugar cookie whenever you're walking around because the dust is so bad. Imagine having diarrhea to the point where you pass out and all of your buddies have to come and pick you up and you look like a diarrhea-crusted sugar cookie. Oh, that's cute. Oh, my God. The amount that you guys give up is insane. I know. It's crazy. People don't realize that. Right, yeah. And they started from, really, like in the Marine Corps, they started from day one. Like they, tr- Like you say that, like large saying that that's not something you could get used to. They make you get used to it really at day one of boot camp because like how we, right. uh, at least on, on my, from my experiences, you'll have 30 or 40 different toilets that are lined up with no walls in between, no <laughs> barriers in between, just 40 <laughs> toilets that are just out in the middle of nowhere. When you're first there, you're so, everybody is so uncomfortable to go to the bathroom and take a shit essentially. Right. By week 13, no one gives a fuck. Really? Like you, you'll come in from a run. People are talking to each other, writing letters to their girlfriend home and everybody like grunting like, oh, nice push, dude. Like by the time you're done, all of those semblances of shame are gone. And that's why military people, I think, are different about that stuff. Like I, 
Like I see all business people. Like I would never go to the bathroom outside of your out of my house. Large, you're that way too. One hundred percent. I have to find yes. a nice hotel. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Me, I'm like you, fucking... chaps. I'll go on. Uh, you know, forty in a row. <laughs> I'll find a Waffle House outside of Bankhead in Atlanta and rip it in there. <laughs> <laughs> two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so then let me tell you something then. Uh, now, outside of your condition, which I swear I'm going to get to, do you, because I, I don't mean to group you in with this other group of people, professional athletes have mm-hmm. a certain degree of lack of shame because they've always showered with each other and they've always been in kind of like sports camps with that too. I tell a story all the time. I used to work with a guy who was, um, who was a fullback in the NFL and there were 10 stalls at Citigroup. And the middle stall had a door ripped off. Just the door was ripped off. It was 10 stalls. And in front of those 10 stalls was 10 urinals. And there weren't any taken up stalls. Like maybe one and two and nine and 10. But five, there was nothing around it. And I walked in and I was like, hey, Ziggy. Like just he just takes shits without the door just because it was like easier. He didn't even have yeah. to push the door. And I have I noticed it with Ned, too. Like, mm-hmm. Ned will go, Ned Bolkar, a friend of mine, he'll go and use a, uh, walk into a bathroom, like, barefoot. Like, <laughs> it's just like professional athletes have that lack of shame, too. So you fast forward to now. Again, sans the condition. Have you gotten more civilized again? Or do you think you can just shit in front of me? Like me, like me, a guy that you know, we haven't hung out a lot because of the, the distance and stuff. But would you just all of a sudden shit in front of me? I don't think I would you because of respect for you. Oh, thanks. And now <laughs> I know yeah. you, your stomach being weaker. Ooh, I, yeah. I don't think I would do it right. in front of you. How Feidelberg, Feidelberg's getting it. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I got gotcha. you. Yes. Because this one fucks me up. Thomas Edward Silverstein, he was born in 1952, right? He was an American convicted murderer. He'd been incarcerated continuously since 1977. Let's kind of keep that time frame. Born in 52, at 25, he goes into jail, 1977. He'd been convicted of four separate murders while imprisoned, while imprisoned, one of which he stabbed Raymond Cadillac Smith, the national leader of a black prison gang. He stabbed the guy 67 times on accident. He stabbed him 67 fucking times, and then he dragged Raymond Cadillac Smith's body up and down the prison tier so that other prisoners still locked in their cells could see the bloody corpse. That's hardcore. Where are the guards? Yeah, exactly. Where are yeah. the guards? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where they were, to be honest with you. That's probably a question I should have asked. Prison authorities described him as a brutal killer, obviously, and he was also a former leader of the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang. That's probably it. Aryan Brotherhood kind of gets a couple of you know, yeah. guards look the other way. He was also known as Terrible Tom, which is a very weak nickname for a multiple murderer Aryan. Terrible Tom sounds, ter- I don't know, I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, I think if you're just going to have Terrible, you have to go first name first. Like yeah, I, Ivan the Terrible, like yes. that guy, that sounds, woo. Yeah. Sounds terrible. The only thing worse is if they call him Terrible Tommy. Yeah. Terrible Tommy would have been terrible. Well, you get murdered for that. Yeah. yeah. Here's what makes him special. In 1983, so six years into his stint, he killed a prison guard named Merle Klutz at the Marion Penitentiary in Illinois and was thrown into solitary confinement. Confinement. Klutz had been stabbed 40 times with a homemade shank. I don't know what it is, but they really... They're thorough. Like, shanking people is a thorough thing. Yeah, you got to get the vitals. Yeah, Yeah. 62 times for the Cadillac Smith, and then 40 times for Merle Klutz. So he's thrown into solitary confinement. But the solitary he was in was not a typical one. They created a special prison within a prison for him, the Silverstein Suite. And it was located at the end of a building isolated from the main prison. The Silverstein Suite seems like it might be something that would be in the like the Four Seasons now. This looks like that scene from um, Goodfellas, where all they're in there and they're mincing the garlic with with razor blades. But it's, it's like this is like a nice this is a nice Chicago apartment. This is deceptive. So I put a picture of it, and so the walkway and all the stuff that's outside of the three rooms mm-hmm. were abandoned. The walkway was okay. never used. And neither was the visiting room, obviously, because he never had a visitor. So you're saying that his life now, and that's and again, this is this is deceptive. 
was to three different rooms. One of them was the indoor recreation room, which had no windows. Then there was his cell, which is in the middle, which just looked like a regular cell, toilet, shower, and bed. And then the third one was very much like the uh, indoor recreation room, except part of the ceiling had a grate where you could see the sun. So it wasn't... That vitamin D. And he never had any visitors, and guards were instructed to never speak to him. There he was kept in a cell for 23 hours per day. At certain times, an electronic door opened for one hour for that room on the far right. And that's when he can go out and see sunlight for one hour a day. That's fucking crazy. So he could step into the private outside recreation area or in the indoor recreation cage. So both those doors opened up for an hour with an electric time lock every day. Silverstein did 2,000 sit-ups and 1,000 push-ups every day to stay fit. He was pretty ripped. That's like uh, Herschel Walker's training. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 plus so, ballet. Yep. Yeah. Those three rooms, his cell and the two recreational cages, were his entire world. The only time that he saw other humans was when food was brought to his cell by guards, who, again, were instructed not to talk to him. Silverstein spent the next 36 years of his life in solitary before finally dying alone in 2019 at the age of 67. So terrible Tom Silverstein spent the last 42 years of his life in prison, and he deserved to, but 36 of those were in the hole, making him the longest-held prisoner in solitary confinement with the Bureau of Prisons, and he did it in Illinois. That's kind of- That's a record. It's not going to be broken. I have a wife and three kids. Hang a banner. I love them. But every now and again, I wouldn't mind going to solitary for a couple of days and just being in the dark and hanging out. If the food was okay there and the bed was comfortable, yeah. sign me the fuck up. But honestly, can you... Have you ever been to prison? You ever been to, no. Okay. I spent one night in jail. I okay. spent one night in jail. M- longest night in my life. 36 years... Like, I, I, w- I would rather this guy, first of all, he's a burden on the taxpayers. What? Like, would, would you rather die or be, pu- or be in uh, solitary confinement for 36 years? Is there, is there hope I'm getting out? There's no hope you're getting out. Once you kill a prison guard and four other people inside prison, you're fine. just kill me. I would think you just kill yeah. me. Yeah. You say stuff casually. You say stuff like Overwatch duty. Is that what I'm thinking? Is it like you're on a, a guard tower? Yeah, on a roof, yeah. So like whenever we would go in places, we would take a house, typically in an area that was- You mentioned that too. You just take over a house. Yeah, like go up to it and kick everybody out and you set up security and stuff like that. Like that's what we did all the time. Would they Would they offer it up as opposed to being kicked out to show that they were kind of friendly? No. Um, no, huh? We would give them money, like, but- I, I, Looking back, it's probably one of the worst things that I've done in my life, like wh- that I have legit regret for. Really? I mean, it, just imagine how traumatizing that would be to oh. see 20 reconnaissance Marines roll up to your house in full combat battle rattle with huge weapons, with long si- like suppressors and things like that, long guns, and you walk up into their house and you tell them to get out. Like, and you, you have 10 minutes to get everybody and get the fuck out. Do you mind talking Come about back this? in a week. Sure, no. No, you don't mind talking about this. Uh. So then where do they go? You don't care? Don't care, yeah. Like, a, a lot of it, and it's callous to say you don't care, but you you identify houses on, like, um, images, like the satellite imagery uh-huh. of where you need to go and the routes that they can leave the city. And so then you identify the house, you take that house, and then you conduct your operations from that house for a few days. Okay. And then you'll go through each, like we would go through each and every one of the different houses in the villages looking for weapons, looking for weapons caches and things like that. Would Explosive anyone, materials. Would anyone balk? Like would they say, not my house, go to another one? I'm no, going to protect my I mean, family once, and stuff? Or is it the big guns? Once you're already there, like it, when you have that many much firepower that you're showing up, too, there's not a whole lot of argument really from most people. There'll right. be yelling and screaming and things like that, like scared, um, but never like we're not going to do it type of situation. Mad science plus rocket science equals Jack Parsons. 
Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was born in 1914. His name is Jack Whiteside Parsons. Great name. He was responsible for much of the foundation of American rocket scientists. He invented the first rocket engine to use a castable composite rocket propellant. And he pioneered the investment, the advancement of both liquid fuel and solid fuel rockets. His team, before they became something that sounded regular, like the rocket whatever, they were called the Suicide Squad because they were working with such high-powered accelerants and whatnot. So Jack Parsons was the pioneer, okay? I don't know what any of those achievements entail because this is a history podcast. I don't know about rocket science, right? Mm -hmm. But I've read enough to know that he was legit in his field. And Parsons is regarded among the most important figures in the history of the U.S. space program. So this isn't some secondary or tertiary figure that I'm finding. This is like Tony Stark's dad, okay? He actually looks like Tony Stark's dad. Yeah. Yeah, look him up. All right, so, however, Jack's brilliance in the technical field will ultimately be overshadowed by his intense curiosity about the occult. What do I mean? He was a devotee of Aleister Crowley, who was a freak. Aleister Crowley was a freak. He was a British occultist and ceremonial magician who founded the religious philosophy called Thelema. And that basic tenet of Thelema was do what thou wilt. Almost like do what you want. All right? Although he was often referred to as the wickedest man in the world, Aleister Crowley was not a Satanist. Even though Ozzy Osbourne wrote a song about him, Mr. Crowley, my son plays it. It's about Aleister Crowley. But he was an important influence on the later development of religious Satanism. And two of the most prominent figures of religious Satanism, Anton Levy and Michael Aquino, were heavily influenced by Crowley's work. The twisted history of Satanism is an, in, is an inevitability. I might even do it next week. Who knows? Anyone who knows anything about Satanism, hit me up. Or if you're a Satanist, hit me up. We'll have me on. Okay? Back to Jack Parsons. So on top of being like, okay, I got all this stuff going. We're about to launch the thing. What do we do before? All the checklists? What else do you need to do, Jack? I need to invoke the Greek god Pan at the site of every test launch he attended. He had to invoke a Greek god. In 1939, he converted to Thelema, Thelema, and Jack, together with his housemates, were spotted on a number of occasions dancing nude around a fire in his garden in an apparent pagan ritual. Parson and other members partook in other strange Thelemic rituals, including eating cakes made from menstrual blood. Ew. He even used the money from his rocketry business to buy a mansion in Pasadena and made it into a den of hedonism that allowed him to explore sexual adventures like betting his wife's 17-year-old sister and holding cult-like orgies. Do what thou wilt. Eventually, he joined up with science fiction writer, at the time, science fiction writer, soon-to-be Scientology founder, this fucking kook, L. Ron Hubbard, right? Jack meets up with L. Ron Hubbard, the scientific shyster, and together they attempted to raise the mother of the Antichrist in an outlandish ritual that involved chanting, drawing occult symbols in the air with swords, dripping animal blood on runes, and masturbating in order to impregnate magical tablets. So these guys were jerking off on tablets trying to raise the mother of the Antichrist. I'm going to assume there's a lot of LSD there, too. Probably. I just don't want to mention. Here's where the, uh, the jig was up. Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard, soon vanished with, Pars <laughs> with Parsons' girlfriend. He stole his woman, right? And that, the woman's name was Sarah Northrup, who uh, L. Ron Hubbard eventually married. And a significant amount of Jack's money. He robbed them. Parsons was eventually killed at the young age of 37 while working on explosives for a project in his home laboratory when an unplanned detonation destroyed the lab. This guy was a member of the Suicide Squad, remember? He'd done this for fucking, you know, years. Now all of a sudden he's at home messing with that and it's, all of a sudden happens? Maybe there's something there. Some have suggested that he was actually performing a magical experiment. <laughs> Some had said that he was killed. He was like a victim of McCarthyism. He was once pushed out of the country. He worked on the rocket uh, program for Israel for a while. So it seemed like the government might have had it out for him. But we'll never know because he was found with multiple broken bones, a missing right forearm, blew his fucking forearm off, 
and half of his face also ripped off. Let's talk about freedom grooming. Finally. Finally, right? Freedom Grooming makes the best electric razor and shaving essentials for all of us balls. With the Flex Series Kit, you'll get the smoothest shave of your life. The blades contour to the shape of your head for a baby smooth shave every time. The Flex Series is waterproof, so you can save in the shower or without shaving cream. You can shave wet or dry. I'm shaving as we speak. Shave 50% more hair in a single stroke compared to traditional razors and shave in just under five minutes. Freedom has a refill plan, the close shave plan. You'll never run out of fresh, sharp blades delivered to your door every six weeks with free shipping. All active close shave plan members are upgraded to a lifetime warranty, and it's completely customizable. Adjust, skip, or cancel your plan anytime. Let's give you guys a call to action. Freedom is offering our listeners 20% off <coughs> when you go to freedomgrooming.com slash twisted. That's freedom freedomgrooming.com slash twisted. And with that, you will get 20% off when you go to freedomgrooming.com slash twisted. It took me probably a minute and a half to read that copy, and I just freshened up the shave, and I feel goddamn great. You got your whole head, your neckline. 100%. You're, you're smooth. You find me a podcast that does a better read than that. Whoever, whoever pays attention, to that, find me somebody who does better than what I just did for fucking freedom. I defy you to fucking find me that. This never happened, okay? This never, ever happened. But this hoax, this thing had traveled around for decades. Street gang members would drive without headlights uh. on any road until a compassionate motorist driving the opposite way or behind them would see that their lights weren't on and would give them the flashing of the headlights, okay? As soon as they did that, the prospective new gang member in the dark car would have to hunt down and murder everybody that was in the car that flashed the beams at him. That was the gang initiation. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, that little news snippet, and they also gave it like a weekend, like the next weekend is a huge gang initiation weekend. Be on the lookout for it. It spread around the continent like fucking wildfire. Like wildfire. Print references to this gang initiation date back to 1993. But anecdotal information places it as far back as the early 80s when a reader in Montana heard that the Hells Angel bike gang in California was said to be initiating inductees in this fashion. Hells Angels were killing people in this fashion. Yeah. They weren't, but that's what was going around in the 80s. This never fucking happened, John. No. <laughs> Not a single... Don't, don't think you can... My Kung Fu's strong on this. Not a single fucking thing happened. No, no, no. My <laughs> uncle was on the back roads once, and he got caught up with these he was guys. A crip. It yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah. He got away. <laughs> By 1984, the story spread to Eugene, Oregon, and it then changed to a tale of black and Hispanic street gangs in Los Angeles targeting white people. And nothing scares white people more than black and Hispanic street gangs. Mm. So they told every one of their kids, make sure you're on the lookout for it. And so some guys started sending faxes around, as if it was gospel. A fax retelling the details, saying the program Dare. Huh. There was a program Dare. There's back black in the people day. in the neighborhood. We better send a fax. <laughs> yeah. So they said the police were working with Dare, and to spread the word of this initiation, it was received at the Nassau County, Florida Fire Department. That was forwarded to their the police department, and from there to all city departments. Everybody was put on 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 high alert for this gang initiation. From Florida, it traveled all over the country with local police departments and news anchors warning people against flashing their lights. I remember hearing about it in the early 90s, but I didn't give a shit because I didn't drive until I was 21, right? I didn't learn to drive until I was yeah. 21, so it didn't affect me as a young man. It took subways and buses. You're not going to get murdered. always said it. You always, always. He always says, don't, get, don't flash, don't give your high beam setting. 100%. Anymore. I don't want to die to Yeah. As you're on, as you're I on. It. I, I was hooked around. I'm telling you, there's a couple of fucking things that I was into and I'm not proud of. This was one of the ones that I bought. I, I bought this. Within weeks, the Minister of Defense for Canada was taken by it. He forwarded an urgent security warning to all Ontario members of parliament and it keeps resurfacing. There was a similar issue um, sent out in London in 2004. It's multinational, right? And it's all a fucking hoax. Snopes and a handful of other investigative sites have yet to find a single gang-related headlight murder. It's all a fucking hoax. What are you saying? 
I, I just think it's fascinating that you were terrified of the the headlight hoax, but you're you're riding the New York City subway, one hundred percent, the eighties oh, and nineties when it's a lot more than a hoax. Passed out drunk yeah. with nine thousand dollars <laughs> in my pocket for my, after my first uh, Christmas party, where they cut my my uh, they cut my pockets open and robbed me. I was comfortable as all hell during it. You're riding on a dark uh, road and someone's coming at you and you go to high beam them, used to freak me the fuck they out. They still robbed you with olives in your pockets? They, they robbed Normally me. Normally it's like, they'll, that'll keep them away. Like, this guy's got olives in his pockets. No, no, it's dollars. Like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, I just I got thought, my first Christmas bonus. I had nine grand on me. That's really sad. Yeah, $9,000 yeah. on me. I thought you said 9, olives. 9,000 olives. Yeah, I thought you were drunk olives. just shoving olives in your pockets. <laughs> I mean, that's you large. are known for like blue cheese and vodka yeah, olives, so it wouldn't be crazy for you. That was large in the 90s, baby. Wouldn't that be a better story than if I passed out? By the way, I had, I had hair at the time. This is how when Andy fell in love with me. It's 1993. I have hair at the time. Rudy dr- just I'm, hit theater. I'm <laughs> drunk. I get thrown out of the downtown athletic club. It's my first Christmas party for out. Harvey Young and Yerman. <laughs> and I get on the subway and I realize that I had stole 9,000 olives from the downtown athletic club. That would be and I have them all purpose. jammed into my pockets. Nobody would question it either. And some absolutely starving homeless guy who hasn't had a martini in a decade <laughs> kind of smells him on me. So he cuts me open like a fucking pinata and hits the absolute jackpot. 9,000 olives? Oh, yeah, you, I don't have any I money. I he's disappointed. He only got eight grand off me. I don't have any money, just olives. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Which ones? Calvastranos? You know, I'm a fucking <laughs> asshole that I am.